Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on cis loop ligand gated ion channels. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the GABA A receptors, which is a family of cis loop uh, ligand gated ion channels. And we're also going to talk about a class of drugs which act on these GABA A receptors, known as the benzodiazepines, which are used as uh, anti, uh, well, sorry, anxiolytics, which means that they are used in the treatment of anxiety, and they're also used to produce um, uh, amnesia as well in minor surgical uh, operations. Okay, so the GABA A receptors. I suppose I should put a little R there to make sure there's the receptor there. And uh, the benzodiazepine drugs is the topic for this video. So firstly, I'm going to give you um, a little bit of an introduction to the GABA-A receptors, what they do in the context of the whole brain. And uh, then we'll look at the structure of the GABA-A receptors, uh, and we'll look at the drugs that interact with them. We won't just look at the benzodiazepines, we'll look at, you know, agonists, antagonists, uh, open channel blockers, things like that. Uh, but then we'll look at the benzodiazepines in, in particular. Right, okay, so uh, let's begin with the bigger picture. What is the role of the GABA-A receptors within the brain? Okay, so GABA, which stands for gamma amino butyric acid, and what am I doing? G-A-B-A. -A. GABA, which stands for gamma amino butyric acid, is the most important inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. And the GABA-A receptor is the receptor on which it acts. And this butyric acid should totally be linked to the amino, but never mind, butyric acid. So let me show you the structure of gamma amino butyric acid, and then we'll talk about what the GABA-A receptor is doing. Right, so, uh, gamma amino butyric acid then. So butyric acid here is the old name for butanoic acid. So this would now be called butanoic acid. So let me just write that down, okay? And butanoic acid is a carboxylic acid which has four carbons in it, okay? So here are these four carbons. One, two, three, four. And then on this four form, we'll put the carboxylic acid group here. However, this one will be counted as the first carbon of the butanoic acid molecule. So this will be one, two, three, four. Okay, now, uh, what we then need to consider is this gamma amino portion. So that means that we've got an amino group coming off the gamma carbon. Now, this is old nomenclature for naming the carbons of a carboxylic acid. So you call this first carbon that comes off the carboxylic acid group carbon, you call that the alpha carbon. So this is alpha, and then you continue on. So this next one along is beta, the second letter of the Greek alphabet. And then finally, this will be the gamma carbon, uh, the third letter of the Greek alphabet. So off this gamma carbon, we then need an amino group coming off. So let's put this amino group here, okay? And that now is all the fanciness done. So now we just need to saturate everything else by binding hydrogen atoms to everything else. So hydrogen here, hydrogen here, and then more hydrogens here. So this now is the structure of gamma amino, that's this bit here, butyric acid or butanoic acid here. Right, so this is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter within the brain. It uh, binds to GABA-A receptors and it's going to uh, inhibit uh, neurons uh, on which those GABA-A receptors are. So how do GABA-A receptors work? So let's say we have a neuron here. Um, Let's draw a big picture of a neuron here. So the basic structure of a neuron is that you have the cell body with these dendritic processes coming off, okay? And it's the dendritic processes which will have synapses with other neurons. So the inputs into the neuron will be coming in through the dendritic processes. And then the cell body is here with the nucleus at the center here. So this is the nucleus of the neuron. Okay, and then what will happen is that the axon will progress off our uh, soma, our cell body, like so, and then right at the end of the axon 
you'll then have an axon terminal here, and this will then synapse onto uh, another neuron along. Okay, so this is the basic structure of a neuron. So let's label up the essential components. So this is an axon here. Okay, this terminal portion of the axon, which has a little sort of expansion there, this is known as the axon terminal. It's also got another name, a sort of less used name, but it might also be referred to as the synaptic knob. Okay, so if you do hear that terminology, uh, you won't be unfamiliar. Right, and then we've got the soma, which is this sort of core bit here. So let me sort of highlight this. So the portion here off which the dendrites and the axons come. This is the cell body, basically, and the fancy name for the cell body is to call it the soma of the cell. So this is the cell body. And then also off the soma, you then have these dendritic processes, or just dendrites here. Okay, so the dendrites are where all the inputs to the neuron come in. So you'll have another neuron here with its axon terminal synapsing onto the dendrite here. And if this presynaptic neuron here, of which we've only drawn this final bit, so I'm not drawing the whole neuron, I'm just drawing this final little bit here. Uh, if this presynaptic neuron here releases GABA onto the postsynaptic neuron over here, and then what it's going to result in is an inhibition of this postsynaptic neuron. So it's going to make it less likely that the postsynaptic neuron is going to fire an action potential. Okay, so this let's say this presynaptic neuron does want to inhibit this postsynaptic neuron. Then what it's going to do is it's going to release the gamma aminobutyric acid into the synaptic cleft. So the synaptic cleft is the name for the gap between the two neurons. Okay, so I'll label that up. So the synaptic cleft. And then what's going to happen is the GABA is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft, and it's going to bind to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So let's now draw a piece of the postsynaptic membrane out larger. So let's imagine that we've taken this little slice of membrane out, and we're now looking at it here. So I'll draw it now as a phospholipid bi there. Okay, rather than just as a single line, I'm drawing the membrane as having two lines uh, because it's got the inner and the outer leaflet of phospholipids. Okay, so here it is. Right, so this is the membrane here then, in turquoise. And then in the, in the membrane, you will then have these GABA-A receptors. So this is a GABA-A receptor, and as you'll see, there are absolutely loads of different types of GABA-A receptors. So it's not just one receptor that's the GABA-A receptor. There are many different types. Now, when the neurotransmitter binds to the GABA-A receptor and two GABA molecules have to bind to the GABA-A receptor to cause it to open, so two GABA molecules bind to the GABA-A receptor, this causes the GABA-A receptor to open, and then what's going to happen is uh, the GABA... Uh, a receptor is going to conduct chloride anions into the cell. Right, so what's going to happen is it's permeable to chloride anions. Now, chloride anions are generally in a higher concentration outside the cell, okay, than they are inside the cell. Uh, so when you open this channel, chloride anions are actually going to come in. Now, let's just think about this a little more, because this actually is a bit odd. Because if we think about the usual electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, okay, and I'll just remind you of what we mean by electrical potential difference across the membrane. So, basically, if you have a little man who's standing in the extracellular compartment here, so this is the extracellular fluid on this side of the membrane, and this is the cytoplasm on this side of the membrane. If you have a little man standing in the extracellular fluid, he can measure electrical potential in the extracellular fluid at that point he's standing at. And he'll get some value. Let's call that the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment. Okay? So he, he has this little machine for measuring electrical potential, which is just a field, basically. Oh, I might be talking to biology students. Okay, so everywhere in space, 
is ascribed a number, basically, uh, known as its electrical potential. So everywhere in space has a real number ascribed to it, which can be positive or negative, which is the electrical potential. Okay, that's what is meant by a field in physics, at least. In maths, a field means something far uh, different, um, far scarier. Okay, but in physics, a field just means a scalar field, usually. It just means ascribing a mathematical quantity to every point in space, such as, in this case, a real number. So that's what the electrical potential is. So you measure the electrical potential extracellularly, and then he can come in to this intracellular site here, and then he can set up his machine again and measure electrical potential of the intracellular compartment, and he'll get some real number. Now, these two numbers are not generally the same, okay, in cells. Usually the intracellular electrical potential is lower than the extracellular electrical potential. So then what we can ask is what's the difference in electrical potential between these two? But you'll notice a problem there. You have to direct it. Uh, you have to say, what's the difference if I move from extracellular to intracellular? So it's not a quantity that it, you can't just say what's the difference between these two what you well you can ask what the magnitude of the difference between these two is but that's a different question if you're going to say what's the difference between these two you have to say the difference from extracellular to intracellular so that's what is meant by the voltage across the membrane what we really mean voltage is just another name for electrical potential difference when we say the voltage across the membrane or the electrical potential difference across the membrane or the membrane potential, what people strictly mean, but they never tell you, is that then they are taking the electrical potential difference if you move from extracellular to intracellular. So really what they're saying is, what's the new electrical potential, i.e. the electrical potential intracellularly, minus the old electrical potential, i.e. the electrical potential extracellularly. So they really mean this number subtract off the old one. That's what they really mean uh, by um, uh, the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. So they really mean if you were to move from extracellular to intracellular, how much would this number that your, that your machine is showing you, how much would that change? Okay, right. So, we'll continue this discussion in the next video.